last few years has begun to embrace what to many of us is a long overdue issue in American politics and economics, and that is the problem of monopoly power in the economic sphere and uh, bleeding over well into the political sphere as well. My next guest has written a very important book on the topic. The book is entitled, I have it right here for those of you who are watching on video, Goliath, subtitle, The 100-Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy. The author is Matt Stoller. Matt has been a writer, a policy advisor, and active in uh, Democratic Party uh, circles, uh, working in Congress and elsewhere here in Washington, D.C., and he joins us now. So first of all, Matt, thanks for coming on the program. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure, and it's a pleasure reading this book. As you can see, I have made many notes. Um, but let's start with this. Uh, let's just start at that, if you would, at the top level. Um, what do you see as the overall theme of this? A hundred years is a long time, but uh, to me it describes an arc. And uh, uh, an arc that may be turning into a sine wave, we'll find out. But uh, in this struggle between monopoly power and uh, the democratic process, but what do you see as the kind of narrative of the book? So in, uh, in, I constantly kept encountering uh, quotes from um, various New Dealers and political officials uh, and actually monopolists as well. So I'll use one from Ferdinand Pecora who said when he was investigating the giant, uh, important bank, J.P. Morgan, during the uh, depths of the Depression. He said that, that this institution rivals the power of government. And he was talking about a bank. Um, and you see this over and over and over, this contest between whether we're going to have governing power in the hands of concentrated financial institutions, banks, uh, monopolies, or whether we're going to have that power vested in the hands of elected officials. So you see it again, uh, you know, 100 years later or 80, 90 years later, when Mark Zuckerberg says, Facebook is in many ways more uh, like a government than a business. We're really setting policy. So that's something he said. And that's the main theme. It's, it's our governing power lives in our markets. How we do business is how we do justice. And we either govern those markets and structure those markets through our public institutions, or those markets are structured for us by financiers and monopolists who are in fact then governing. Now, one of the things that strikes me about what you described, Matt, is that it's not, it doesn't seem to me anyway, uh, that it's a matter of one side of this debate, should uh, should banks and other large corporations have power, that one side is it prevails for a while and the other loses in the debate, uh, and then maybe it shifts. It seems to me that what happens periodically in American history is that people cease to believe in the reality of mark a monopoly power as a economic and political force. They just, it's as if it isn't there. It seems to me that the members of both parties, uh, it's as if it becomes invisible to them until events and pressure and external forces of various kinds forces them to see it again. It's almost a perception problem. Am I right about that or am I off base? Well, I don't, I, I'm not a, uh, so I, t I write a lot about um, kind of the philosophy of of democracy, right? I mean, it's a it's a book about stories, not like a, a it's not not a lot of jargon, not a lot of like you know. Here's what Hegel said or whatever. Right. But it's like what happened. Um, something happened weirdly in the 1970s. I don't I don't think it's actually like cyclical. Um, from the 1790s until the 1970s, Americans understood that concentrated financial power was a political threat. Right. So it didn't go back and forth. Right. You know, yes, the robber barons broke out in the 1880s, 1890s, and there were fights over that. But even when that was happening, Americans understood that this was a problem. This was contrary to their democratic tradition. What happened in the 1970s is that a new generation of uh, of, uh, uh, of politicians took over and they were heavily influenced by a, a set of thinkers on the right and the left who made the argument that that corporate power and concentrated financial power didn't exist. Right. That um, that corporations and banks were not political institutions. They were just sort of natural. There was a natural, inevitable um, sort of evolutionary path that we humanity just kind of went on. And this was John Kenneth Galbraith on the left, Richard Hofstetter on the left, and then uh, the Chicago School on the right. 
and and and, and Galbraith said, you know, at a certain point, um, it's a, the vanity of modern man is that he can affect his economic system, right? So these people didn't believe in free will in some sense. They didn't believe in democracy. And that really took over in the 1970s because this was very uh, heavily influential in the counterculture. And then it really hit in force in policy in the 1980s when Reagan took over. And you're right, people stopped seeing corporate power. They just didn't see it. They didn't believe it existed. And politics shrank to become questions about, you know, social questions like flag burning or, or various other things, maybe marginal tax rates, but largely, you know, how a bank operated or how a corporation operated was not a political question until the financial crisis in 2008, all of a sudden kind of announced to all of us that this is that how banks operate are deeply political questions. But um, really from the late 1970s until 2008, it's a very weird period in American history and an anomaly in which people just were persuaded that uh, most of our political economy choices were not choices. They weren't things that humans did. They were just sort of the inevitable results of technology and and um, and and physical realities and and globalization or just it just kind of pulled free will out of the process. And so as a result, you saw the concentration of power all over the economy in monopolies. You know, one of the interesting things about that, you mentioned it just now and you, you, you describe it at length in the book, Matt, Matt Stoller, is the uh, class of 1974 in Congress. They were right. called the Watergate babies, right? They were, uh, many of them were elected uh, as Democrats uh, as a reaction against the Nixon presidency and, and the collapse of it. Um, and they, you know, uh, they their hair was a little longer. They were largely men. Uh, so their right. hair was a little longer. Maybe their sideburns were a little longer. They seemed a little hipper by the uh, right. fashions of the time. As you say, stronger connections to the counterculture. And uh, along with that, somehow a belief that the economy was like organic, you know, there was just a thing right. that happened and right. you go with the flow, you don't fight it. Um, it's interesting that you describe it as an anomaly, but it's one that I guess lasted at, in many ways into the Obama presidency, didn't it? Yeah, so, and that was 1974, that was the first year that Bill Clinton ran for office, he ran for Congress. He didn't win, but he nearly won. And what you saw was this generation, the beginnings of a generational turnover in both parties. So it hit the Democrats in 74, it hit the Republicans in 78. Um, but yeah, there was a kind of um, a kind of a transmission gap there, right? Where these old lessons, and I chronicle Wright Patman, who's a sort of an old populist, right. but he comes from the Jeff Jeffersonian, Brandeisian tradition uh, of, cons of, of decentralizing financial power as a focal foundational element of democracy. And, and then that trans tradition did not get passed on to the boomers, and it didn't get passed on after that to anyone else. So, yeah, I mean, um, the Obama uh, administration and then the Clinton administration, and also people like me uh, and people who are younger, when we were confronting, uh, when we all of us saw the financial crisis, you know, the Obama people had been trained to disdain the New Deal. There were a lot of bad lessons that they had, but they also they had a bad sense of history in their heads. But then, uh, but then so did I, so did kind of all of us. And I had different instincts. I have more populist instincts, but even, you know, it's like I was looking at a banking crisis and I thought, oh, that's a technical problem in the banking system. What's the right way to handle this? But what I should have been looking at, and this is to understand is this was a political crisis. The banks were political institutions and that the decisions that these bankers were making were decisions that have to do with public policy choices. So it's like that trans that transmission um, problem, like where we just that whole tradition, just we never we never learned it, and now we're kind of rediscovering it. Um, we're rediscovering it now. And and one of the uh, you uh, you mentioned uh, Representative Wright Patman, and if your book has a protagonist or a hero, arguably it's Wright Patman. Uh, I did not realize that his career uh, was as long as it was. And one of my little sticky notes here has to do, first of all, you mentioned Mellonism, which is a reference to uh, to um, the Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon, who was also a banker, who I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, served uh, uh, in that role in both uh, Democratic as well as Republican 
administrations, and so melanism is your word, I suppose you could call it melanoma, but it would have been a little more, more morbid, your word for what he represented. Now, it's interesting, it was quite interesting to me that to read that a 29-year-old, and again, correct me if I get it wrong, but that a 29-year-old representative, Patman, new to Congress, actually called for the impeachment of Andrew Mellon. Is that right? So, so uh, Mellon was very well respected by both parties. He was a Republican, and he, he served in 1921, which is um, under, under Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge, and Herbert Hoover, all of them were Republican presidents. And one of the reasons he got the job is because he, he, his bank lent $1.5 million to Warren Harding's campaign, in, and he financed the attack on Wilson, the Treaty of Versailles. Um, but he was kind of known as the greatest secretary of the treasury since Alexander Hamilton, right? And he was enormously powerful until the Great Depression, which he oversaw and didn't do anything to help the public, even though the banking system had collapsed. There was 25 percent unemployment. It was just a catastrophe. And this young uh, co former cotton tenant farmer named Wright Patman from Texarkana, a very, very poor district. Uh, and I think he was in his like mid to late 30s when he did this, but he was young. He filed articles of impeachment against Andrew Mellon. And Andrew Mellon was the third richest or second richest man in the country, probably the most, the wealthiest person to hold office in American history. Uh, and he held a very powerful office. He was the treasury secretary, which meant he was also at that time, the ex officio chairman of the Federal Reserve. And he ran what today we call the IRS. This guy's super powerful, uh, tied deeply into the bank. He says he owns Alcoa, he owns Gulf Oil, he owns uh, another company called Coppers, all three of whom are Fortune 500 companies or the equivalent of it. He's on the, the board of, of, of 200 banks, although you know he steps down uh, when he becomes treasury secretary. This guy is so powerful. And this like poor former cotton uh, tenant farmer gets up and files articles of impeachment in 1932. And everyone's like, ah, oh, that's just Patman, whatever. And then Hoover starts sending people to, or somebody starts sending people to break into his office and spy on him. And he gets mocked in the press. And then a week later, he lays out his case to the Judiciary Committee which included his, one of his allies, who was Fiorello LaGuardia, who was a congressman at that time. And all of a sudden, everybody realizes that Patman's case is kind of pretty much airtight, that uh, Mellon was, was using his position to engage in systemic self-dealing. Um, he was threatening foreign leaders uh, and getting oil concessions and concessions to his own companies. He was using the IRS for, to, for his own benefit and to punish his political enemies. A lot of echoes of today. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... Um, and then Hoover very quickly decides that he has to fire Andrew Mellon, and so he does. But what's exciting and interesting, and so there's a lot of echoes to the Trump impeachment, right? The, the crisis of legitimacy and a, a, an administration which is involved in, in deep uh, levels of self-dealing. Andrew Mellon is a kind of, he's not the president, uh, although the joke was that three presidents served under him. He's right. more like a combination of a, of a Charles Koch and an enormously powerful political figure, or a Warren Buffett and an enor and and like an Alan Greenspan. So it's exactly. I have to interrupt you, right. Matt, to say that I was at, going to come back and say when I think about uh, when I think about Mellon, uh, I envision a combination of Alan Greenspan and Warren Buffett. Those words were in my head. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah, uh, so the nerve of this guy, Patman, to step up against him at a time right. when there was bipartisan admiration for him, uh, it was in the, in the parlance of today, number one, pretty badass, and number two, I think historically significant because he was showing that he, he perceived and was willing to state what I, I believe most other politicians in both parties were not, correct? Yeah, that's right. There were there was a lot of fear of Mellon, even in 1932. And at the same time, remember, there was a uh, there were a series of giant protests that were taking place at the same time, backing up Patman. So one of the protests was a, a, a lot of World War I veterans who were now really poor because of the Depression. And they were they wanted to get their pension paid a little bit earlier so that they could, you know, buy cars or buy or or get food for their families or whatever and start businesses. And they were but they didn't or or even just get a home, right? Because a lot of them were homeless. And so they marched on Washington. And this was called um, this was called the bonus army, because because their opponents started saying, Oh, you guys just want a bonus for your service in the war, like that's crazy. And so they they reappropriated that. They became the bonus army and they were marching and they camped out in uh, in DC, very much like Occupy Wall Street, actually. 
and it was a multiracial protest, and it put a lot of pressure on the Hoover administration. And they were there to support the Patman bill, which would have paid out their pension. And the main opponent to the Patman bill was Andrew Mellon. And so it was really this foundational question of whether the government or the people who had fought in World War One, who had been sort of promised this American, uh, who had this kind of American promise, or whether it would just be under the control of banker monopolists like Andrew Mellon. And that was that was foundational. And it was this bitter fight in Congress around legislative uh, maneuvering. It was also an impeachment and it was a giant protest. And it really laid the foundation for what would come later in the New Deal. So this is before FDR is elected, right? This is before FDR is even nominated. And, and what struck me about the Bonus Army, which I knew about, but in your reading of it, and by the way, here, for those watching on TV, this little note, believe it or not, says, Mellon like Greenspan and Buffett. Uh, I just can't get over it. Um, but uh, uh, what struck me it was, uh, uh, and again, if I'm working from memory, but uh, that establishment, politicians of both parties, basically spoke dismissively of them. Uh, and uh, treated them as if not, oh, they just want a break and they're just rabble, as opposed to them perhaps reflecting yeah. uh, some other underlying problems and injustices and having yeah. a legitimate case. And that seems to me that that too, as well as Andrew Mellon's uh, famous uh, statements that, that uh, the market should just allow uh, hundreds of thousands of farmers to be wiped out and Herds housing. The from this also echoes of today, right? That's right. I mean, the New Republic and the nation both went after the bonus army. They were like, these guys are just selfish. You know, like it was, I mean, you know, and the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, you know, said it was like, super, they were super racist, right? So they, they were like, hey, if, um, if you pay out the, these bonuses, uh, you know, there's a bunch of black uh, veterans of World War One. And, you know, what they'll do is they'll just they'll just stop working. And they used all sorts of racial caricatures. I think um, Thomas Edison was opposed to the bonus. Um, all of like there was just sort of the establishment in general was just deeply hostile to this kind of uh, to this kind of relationship. For the, the government could back the bankers and did, but it couldn't back the, the kind of ordinary people. Uh, and that's why there was such hostility from the establishment for the bonus army and Patman and these marchers and then a bunch of allies in Congress and elsewhere ended up um, defeating that argument. Uh, and, and eventually Hoover, F Hoover fires Mellon, then he tear gasses the protesters, at which point FDR realizes, oh, I guess I, you know, I guess I'm going to win without having to really run a campaign because um, it was so unpopular. And then, uh, you know, Hoover was just despised and Mellon was despised. Uh, but then they had to fight against FDR because FDR didn't want to pay the bonus. And finally, in 1936, at the height of FDR's po po um, popularity, the House and Senate Democrats overrode FDR's veto to get them, these, these veterans, the bonus, right? So, so you're talking about a very different Democratic Party. Can you imagine that in 2009 or 10, the Democratic House and Senate overriding Obama on something to the left of him? Right. That's what was going on in the 1930s. Well, it, that would have been nice if that had happened in 2009 or 2010. Again, we're talking with uh, Matt Stoller, author of the new book, Goliath. And Matt, I want to um, I want to fast forward history wise uh, and maybe get to the 1950s, the uh, post uh, FDR, post Truman era, because one of the things that, that, that was, uh, to me, very interesting about your book and setting the narrative for the, some of the political challenges we have today in terms of monopoly power is uh, it, it, you, you talk about uh, several uh, critical thinkers, thinkers whose work shaped that kind of liberal democratic thought of today. One was Richard Hofstadter, who I remember reading avidly when I was young, the historian. Um, the other is the economist John Kenneth Galbraith, who you mentioned earlier. Um, but basically, they created, um, as I read your book, a, an intellectual worldview that permitted the, and I, I don't want to speak for you, but this is my, what I got from it, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but they created this sort of odd historical uh, ellipsis in terms of our understanding of mon monopoly power. Is that right? That's right. They uh, they created a history, a fake history of uh, of the United States, and that in that history, they said 
the arguments that um, uh, that the historical arguments that people make about the fights between bankers, uh, railroad barons, and then farmers and merchants in the populist era, uh, the, the strikers in the 1930s, uh, the, all those arguments, that, that didn't actually happen. That's not really a big deal. What actually happened is that you had a bunch of uh, farmers who were Anglo-Saxons who were nervous about immigration. They were, they were, they had status anxiety. Um, and the, um, uh, the, uh, they were, they sort of put their paranoia there, um, on the railroads and the bankers. They're just kind of a bunch of racist cranks. Um, so don't care about corporate power because yeah, sure. There were some like robber barons, but really they were just a little bit boorish in smoke cigars and stuff, but like corporations just kind of advanced, uh, over that time. And that's, in a lot of ways, the the modern culture of the Democratic Party. I mean, the, the, the Watergate babies imbibed this, and it really narrowed it really narrowed politics, um, and it really narrowed our ability to actually understand that we have a heritage of fighting concentrated power. So one of the things Richard Hofstetter said, and both Hofstetter and Galbraith are beautiful writers and really yeah. fun writers. Agreed. But Hofstetter said said um, that you know Hoover, Herbert Hoover, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt had the same ideology. That in America, we've always had the same ideology. We've always been capitalist. It's just that that FDR was sort of a warmer person and, and Herbert Hoover was cold and distrusted. And that's the only difference. And so in doing that, they kind of flattened history and they flattened our understanding of power and they got rid of all of these traditions that had actually been really important to the way that we sustained democracy itself. And again, we're talking with Matt Stoller, author of the book, new book, Goliath. And Matt, by the way, is joining us from, I think, a truck stop or someplace on his book right. tour, in case you're wondering right. about. I'm about, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Where? Allentown. Allentown, okay. Um, where they hate the Billy Joel song about Allentown, and rightfully so, I might add. Um, the, uh, now, uh, let me, f okay, moving forward in history, Matt, so by, uh, you write, by 1958, there were tremors of a new model of financial entrepreneurship. And that, to me, is, was very interesting. This kind of, uh, as you say, uh, fidelity. You talk about Fidelity Capital Fund and Gerald Tsai Jr. Jr. Uh, you write, Fidel, uh, Fidelity began a marketing campaign to make investment sexy, as John Raskob, another figure you, you describe, had done in 1929. This notion that keeps coming back that, you know, the investors, the, the, that class of financier somehow is, uh, are larger than life, glamorous, exciting, who you want to be. That seems like a recurrent theme. And then going into the 1960s, you mentioned somebody I actually used to work for with a layer or two beneath us, between us rather, Saul Steinberg. And I did not know that Saul uh, uh, began as a corporate raider, 29, uh, outsider uh, for religious and other reasons, uh, targeted certain places, including Reliance insurance, which is where I wound up. But uh, it, what the sense I got from this phase of your narrative, Matt, is that based, among other things, these sort of raiders and, 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 and uh, rascally investors made a lot of money and pretty soon banking, which, uh, you know, they used to talk about uh, being out at three o'clock and charging a 3% uh, overhead and then playing golf for three hours, um, the three, three, and three rules, or uh, that they wanted in on this action and that it seemed to me like that somehow contributed to the risky ba behavior in the banking sector that eventually led to the 2008 crisis. How much of that did I get right? You got, I mean, so that's right. Basically what, what happens is in the 1950s, the new dealers have created an economy that's pretty decentralized. There are some big companies. Um, but the banking system is really small and very tightly regulated. And so, yeah, bankers, you know, banking provides a kind of pleasant life for a un unambitious, dull person who went to a fancy school, right? Right. Um, you don't trust a smart banker because they have larceny in their hearts. That's one <laughs> of the phrases that I got, which I loved. And then in the late 1950s and early 1960s, you see the development of this new trend, which I think today we would call personal finance. But it's essentially the same thing that you had in the 1920s, which is like, it's a get rich quick scheme. Um, and it's a bunch of people that want 
to break out of the rules and the tight strictures that the New Dealers had placed on finance. Uh, so this is Walter Riston of National City, which is Citibank. It's Joseph Tsai, who um, runs the first uh, kind of one of the first mutual funds or one of the first modern mutual funds. And then there, there, there's the beginning of the shadow banking system, which blows up uh, really starting in the 70s, but 2008 is when it most famously blew up. And then Saul Steinberg, what this does in the early 60s is they're able to puncture the Glass-Steagall, you know, which is these banking rules in the early 1960s. And, and, and that returns what was called hot money, makes it much easier to speculate. And so in the 1960s, you see a lot of speculation and you see something called the conglomerate boom. And where, where somebody will get a hold of a company and they'll buy, you know, a sneaker company and a missile company and a whole bunch of random different companies using accounting tricks and essentially borrowed money. And this is something that Saul Steinberg did. Saul Steinberg used uh, a, a company he had that did computer leasing. And then he, he ended up, you know, he, it was a $2 million company. He ended up buying Reliance Insurance, which was a $400 million company by just issuing stock. And then... Um, and then he was, uh, he tried to buy Chemical Bank, which was an eight or $9 billion bank, one of the really serious banks. And the, the WASP establishment in the late 1960s was like, whoa, this 29-year-old fat Jewish kid is trying to buy Chemical Bank? Uh, that's outrageous. And they beat him back with a whole bunch of nasty political tactics. But what Saul Steinberg was doing, and, and one of the big problems here for, for these guys who had started to use hot money again, is that they couldn't, they, they just couldn't get enough to really restructure corporate America. And they had these pesky things called antitrust laws, which prevented them from buying all the companies that they wanted to buy. And so the 1970s, when you had the New Deal system sort of started collapsing because the rules had not been updated. And then you had the, the, the Watergate babies coming in who were saying, um, oh, we got to change uh, the way we do politics. We got we to gotta not care about political economy. And then you had the Chicago School, the law and economics guys coming in with all these new legal tools saying, take the constraints off of concentrated capital. And then you had the hot money guys, right, which is, you know, Michael Milken is the, the junk mm -hmm. bond king. He's the guy that really, he gets started in 1970. And then he really explodes in the 1980s, meets, matches up with people like Saul Steinberg. And that's when these guys that are just playing around with conglomerates, become, in the 60s, they become billionaires in the 1980s. And a whole new generation, very explicitly, you know, Michael Milk and Drexel, that those guys are trying to recreate the Mellons and the Morgans. And they say that, and they do. And that's what's so interesting. And the Watergate babies, who by then are, are have become the, the DLC, the Democratic Leadership Council, they're also known as the Atari Democrats, the New Democrats, the neoliberals, whatever. They are very much supporting this, uh, this kind of financialization of the economy, as well as the roll-ups in a lot of different markets that happens because of the evisceration of antitrust law. So I, in the few minutes we have left, and yet, by the way, you quote once again, uh, you know, Wright Papman saying, if you exempt banks from antitrust, you might as well shoot the policeman on the corner. So eventually we have, uh, you know, the Travelers Insurance Citigroup merger, so right. many right. Uh, cases like this. Um, in terms of where we are today, uh, you know, I, I think uh, in, in trying to pull this all together for people now, in my introduction, Matt, I said that I thought there was increasing awareness, and, and, and your efforts have certainly uh, been a, a part of that, but an increasing awareness that we have a monopoly problem in this country uh, with uh, some Democrats and so, a few Republicans, too, I would say, but correct me if I'm wrong there too, but we have a growing understanding of this and it's almost as if, and perhaps this is uh, me reading into it, but it's as, almost as if you're saying that this is a fundamental issue that stands outside even the economic left-right as we see it, whether or not you think the U.S. should be more like a Nordic democratic socialist society or not, or wherever you stand on this issue, that uh, breaking up monopolies, breaking the grip that monopoly power has on the economy and on the political process is something that, one, is fundamental to getting back on track, and two, that is really uh, not part of that uh, traditional left-right axis. And, uh, uh, but what do you think of that summary? Is it on point, off, or what? Yeah, I think that's that basically gets back to the point of, do you want to live in a democracy or not? Because if you want to live in a democracy, if we want to live in a democracy, then we have to be structuring our markets so that uh, so that the terms and conditions of those markets are ones that we set, we the people set through competition, through regulatory choices, 
And if we don't, if we choose not to do that, and this, we always have this choice, and sometimes we choose one direction and sometimes we choose another, um, then the terms and conditions of those markets are going to be picked by guys like Mark Zuckerberg, and then they are going to corrupt our politics, which they've done. And I, I guess, you know, in closing, and then I'll give you the last word, it seems to me that we need to get away from the notion that uh, certain politicians or parties are quote unquote pro-business because that's a misleading term if what they are in fact is pro-corporation or pro-monopoly. Pro-monopoly, right. It, right, that's not pro-business, it's pro- No, that's, pro you're right. That, and that's, that's the thing is anti-monopolists are pro-business because monopoly is a threat to business. Monopoly holds back business formation. Monopoly holds back the creation of wealth. This is why people get really confused about this problem and the socialists are really off the mark. They think they are anti-business because they can't distinguish between small and big business and they can't distinguish between finance monopoly and actual commerce. Populists are, are anti-finance and anti-monopoly, but pro-commerce, pro-business. So that's kind of where we're moving back to. We're moving back to a very uh, a sort of pro, uh, a pro-business, but, but um, anti-finance model. That's a very traditional American model for how to do political economy. But it's confusing because it, it doesn't map onto the left-right 1980s divide, uh, the Gal Galbraith versus uh, Robert Bork, where really the question is kind of, well, we're concentrating power. It's just a question of whether your team or my team is in charge. It's it's this third way, third model which says let's um you know we're gonna we're gonna uh, decentralize power through open markets, um and and we're the the democratic institutions can set the rules, but we're not gonna concentrate power. Okay, well, I think that's probably as good a, a summary as any. So. Uh... With your permission, Matt, we will leave it there. The book is Goliath, The 100-Year War Between Monopoly, Power, and Democracy. It is, I encourage you to read it. And the author is Matt Stoller. Matt, uh, thanks for writing it, and thanks for coming on the program. Hey, thanks for having me.